Hello everyone and welcome back. Now, in the past few videos, we did a lot of derivation of the heat equation. We talked about its boundary conditions, we talked about it in higher dimensions, and now we're at a point where we can start talking about the mathematics behind everything here, and in particular, getting towards a place where we can actually solve the equation. Now, in this lecture, I would like to briefly comment on a very important property of the heat equation, and that is that it's linear. So we're going to talk about linearity of an operator. And this might be something that's familiar to you if you studied uh, any linear algebra, because we think about matrix multiplication as being a linear operation, right? It's a transformation from one dimensional, uh, from some dimensional space into another dimensional space, where those dimensions are given by the size of the matrix. We can actually generalize this, and we could say that a linear operator so a linear operator, let's call, let's use L for linear here, satisfies, satisfies this property. Well, it's sort of a distributive property here. And again, hopefully you can recognize this from matrix multiplication. So if you take L to be some matrix, U1 and U2 to be some vectors, well then you get this linearity property. So you can distribute the linear operator over the sort of vectors, and this is gonna work for any linear combination, right? So you would say for all C1 and C2 in say the real numbers, but really you can use sort of any field you want here, so complex numbers will work. And in our case, we're gonna use functions u1 and u2. But of course, these could be vectors or, or any sort of other sort of abstract quantity um, that you would like to work with. Now, linear operators are going to form a lot of what we're going to talk about going through with this class. We're going to see them again in, in sturm liouville theory. Uh, we're going to see them here with the heat equation. We'll see them later with the wave equation and a number of other equations. So even though I'm going to do everything here for the heat equation, this, you know, I'm going to recall linearity as we move through um, this course. And in particular, what I want to do is I want to talk about what I call the heat operator. Okay, so again, I'm interested in operators. Typically, operator is a word that's uh, reserved in mathematics for a function of functions. Okay, so again, L is a, an operator because it's taking function inputs. That's really uh, sort of what, how we think about this term operator. Now, the heat operator, well, I'll call it L of u, since it's, we're going to show that it's a linear operator. And it takes in a function, it takes its time derivative, and subtracts off a multiple of its second space derivative. Okay, So in this case, I need functions that are both functions of space and time. And they need to be twice differentiable in space and once differentiable in time. So that's sort of my input or my domain of my linear heat operator here. And essentially what you can see is that, you know, solving the, the heat operator equal to zero solves a version of our heat equation, the really simple version that we worked with previously. So of course, the first thing that we'd like to do is we'd like to prove linearity of this thing. So that means that we need to verify this linear property, this sort of distributive property. So let's take constants C1 and C2. They could be anything you want. And let's take any two functions, U1 and U2, so that I, can, I at least can take these derivatives, okay? So we're not gonna dwell on what the derivative or what the domain of these things are too much. We're gonna leave that for a slightly more advanced class because uh, you need a little bit of functional analysis to talk about. But for now, let's just assume we can take derivatives so that we don't have to worry about anything too complicated here. Well, of course, the first thing that's going to happen here is you're going to take a time derivative of this summation. And then you're going to subtract off a second space derivative of this summation. Now, the beautiful thing here is that derivatives are linear themselves, right? So I can actually distribute this uh, derivative here. Let's actually use some colors. This can be distributed into each piece of the sum. And you can see the same thing here, right? If I take uh, f and g, if I take the derivative of f plus g, it's just the derivative of f plus the derivative of g. That's the linearity property. 
Okay, so let's do it. Here, I take C1 times the partial derivative of U1 with respect to T plus C2 times the partial derivative of U2 with respect to T. That's distributing and pulling the, the constant out all at the same time. Then minus, I do the same thing over here. I get K times C1 second derivative of U1 in space. And then K times C2 second derivative of U2 in space. Okay, so everything's going well here. Now what I would like to do is I'd like to group some like terms and I'm gonna group them according to whether or not they have a C1 or a C2 in them. So here we go, C1, now I have partial U, partial T, and uh, minus K, second partial U1, sorry, partial, second partial in space. I just took the C1 terms and I factored out the C1. Plus C2, partial U2, partial T, minus K, partial squared U2, partial X. Second partial, right? Okay, but take a look at what I've got now. This is C1, and now this is the heat operator applied to U1. So C1 L of U1 plus C2 L of U2. But that's exactly the heat operation. And one thing that you'll notice here is, is down here I used brackets. Up here I didn't use brackets. Now this is something that I'm going to kind of do back and forth. Um, I use the brackets typically to indicate that this is sort of a function of a function. But sometimes we don't use the brackets to really emphasize the connection between matrix algebra and these sort of abstract functions of functions, okay? So similarly, you don't write a bracket of x. You just write a times x. So typically, you know, as you get into higher level math, when you start generalizing linear algebra, you sort of generalize that notation as well. So you say L times U2 instead of L of U2. Now, I'm going to go back and forth, but I want you to see the correspondence here at least. Now, this leads to what we're going to call the linear heat equation. So the linear heat equation. Now, this is essentially LU, L of U, equal to a function F, which, let's take a look at this. This is partial of U with respect to T minus k partial squared u with respect to x is equal to a function and this could be a function of both space and time if we really wanted it which we could just rewrite in our sort of standard heat equation form right so this would be the heat equation with a source term remember we called this this function q in the previous uh, lectures where we sort of derived this equation. So what we can see here is that we have two cases. One, if the source is zero, so there's no heat input to say our rod, um, then this implies what's called a homogeneous equation. So the homogeneous equation. Okay, so that's essentially a null space problem, right? Ax equal to zero. But you can also have, if f is not identically zero, there's some sort of heat input in either space or time or both, then this is a non-homogeneous equation, right? So this is Ax equal to b, for example. And Again, if you watched my previous ser lecture series on ordinary differential equations, you've already seen how this works because we did it for ordinary differential equations. The only difference here is that you have partial derivatives instead of ordinary derivatives. But linearity is the same property that we saw with matrices and with ordinary differential equations. Now, the real important piece here is what's called the principle 
of superposition. Now this is going to be really sort of our guide for moving forward, okay? If I actually wanna solve this partial differential equation, I'm gonna use the principle of superposition over and over and over and over and over again, okay? So what does this thing say? It says that if u1 and u2 satisfy, satisfy a linear homogeneous uh, equation, Notice that I didn't specify the heat equation. The heat equation is an example, but again, I said that I'm gonna use this linearity property on a bunch of partial differential equations. So anything that satisfies this, and it's a homogeneous equation, so it's L, U, L of u is equal to zero. So you have any two solutions to a homogeneous linear equation. Okay, then, so does any linear combination of those two things. Right? For all C1 and C2 and R. And essentially, you know, the, again, if you think about matrix algebra, this should make a lot of sense because uh, you have two vectors in the null space of a matrix. You can add any linear combination of those two things together and you still get a vector in the null space, right? It's a vector space, something you could, you could easily prove. Same thing here. And again, the proof is really easy, right? Because each one of these individually is equal to zero tells you the whole thing is equal to zero. It's a one-liner, right? And it just uses this. Now, there is something very important here, though, that I didn't talk about. And I'll give you the opportunity to pause the video and figure out what it is that I left out. Because I did a whole video about it. It's the boundary conditions, right? So linearity, so here I'm just talking about the operator itself, but if I want to pin down solutions, I got to talk about boundary conditions. So linearity and homogeneity, they also apply to boundary conditions. Okay, so I didn't talk about boundary conditions here. We're going to see how it comes up later, but if the boundary conditions are linear in the derivatives, so there's no squares of derivatives, no square roots of derivatives, nothing like that, so that the boundary conditions we looked at in the previous video on boundary conditions, they're all linear boundary conditions. You can easily check that using the definition. And we would call them homogeneous if, you know, you're, if these things are equal to zero. So for example, Dirichlet or Neumann boundary conditions, those are homogeneous boundary conditions. Okay, it's a quick one but it lays down all of the theory that we've spoken about so far. So this lecture is gonna allow us to actually solve the heat equation in the next video. So I'll see you there, everybody.